Constable William Williamson came in and said, Inspector McTaggart, I've got bad news for you. There's been another one of them. Another one of the what? You don't mean another of those beggars on Argyle Street, do you? Don't bother me with that again. No, it's not a beggar on Argyle Street. It's none of those bodies on the campses. Oh, well, I suppose me and Fiona ought to go out and check it out. So they went and took the tram to Curtin Tillich and climbed up the campses, heading to where they could see the red flag had been hoisted, been stuck in the ground, showing where the body was found. It's a long, long climb up the hill. Up on the brow, they could look out over Glasgow, see the ships moving in and out the Clyde, the trails of aircraft coming into the airport. Beautiful view, isn't it, said Fiona. It's a pity we're up here for such a sad purpose. It is that, a real pity, he said. A little further on, they came to the body. It looked so sad. Someone lying there dead in the nylon cagoule and green wellies. Well, at least this, this body's still got more of it here. It's not like the last one. Last one, the foxes had done a lot of damage. We couldn't get much information about why they died. It'll be the usual thing, said Fiona. Someone just came up onto the hills and died of cold, not putting on enough coats before they went up, or else someone went up on the hills and was so sad they took too many tablets. Happens every year. Aye, it does that. Well... When we get the body back, we'll find out what the cause of it was. Let's just look around the neighbourhood to see if there's any clues here. But there was nothing there. Just the body, the boot, his, in its boots and clothes. Nothing lying around. Died very suddenly by the look of it. No evidence that they sat down and took any poison anyway. Nor, they, nor can they have died of cold, because it's been warm these last three days. Nice warm summer evenings. No one would have died of cold on these evenings. Ah, well. A body had been found in the morning, Daniel. Warm days, warm evenings... People wouldn't, it's not been cold enough to have been a, 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 a real hazard to climbers. A nasty bruise on their face though, isn't it? Yes, nasty mark that. Well, we'll get it down to pathology and see what the cause was. Well, they went back to police headquarters and McTaggart said, Williamson, can you go into the files and find out how many other cases have been this year. A couple of hours later, Williamson came back with a pile of files. Oh, that's a lot, he said. Are they all in our area? No, some are from Aberdeenshire and some are from the Northern Constabulary. How many all told? Well, that's 12 so far this year, and it's, it's only May. Oh, that's a bit odd. Last year we only had eight in the whole year. That's twelve in by May even. And how many have been in the last two months? Oh, ten of them have been in the last two months. Well, that's most unusual. You'd expect to get more cases in the winter. So that means that in April and May we've had ten fatalities on the hills already. How many of them were avalanches? Well, there's one man carried away by an avalanche on Cairn Gorm. But that was, that was in March. Okay. How many were taken by wolves? It's a bit hard to tell, of course. But I don't think on the outside 
can't have been more than one or two that were cases of wolf wolf attacks. You've got to remember the wolves have been largely driven north of the Great Great Glen by now. Yes, yeah, a good thing too," said MacTaggart. I hear that King Olaf has raised the the bounty on a wolf felt to a hundred a thousand krona. The old a hundred krona fee had been in place for a couple of hundred years, and it was useless. It wasn't worth risking your life against wolves for a hundred krona. No wonder that they were raiding everywhere. Let's hope we get rid of them for good soon. Well, so it's not wolves, and it's not avalanches. What's it been put down to? Hard to say. Often the bodies aren't found for two or three weeks after the person died, so we can't really say. Well, this this one's been found pretty promptly. Have you been able, able to trace who it is? Yes, we've had a look at the wa their wallet. It's it's a Mr. Johnson from Paisley. We've got his address. Well, we'll have to go and tell his family what's happened to him. They went along, found the house in Paisley, knocked on the door, and of course, his wife and family were devastated to hear the news. They said he'd just gone out climbing on Saturday afternoon. And that was the last we ever saw of him. He said he'd be back by the evening. Ah, it's Monday now, so he must have must have died on Saturday evening. Oh well, I'm I'm very sorry. I'm I don't know what I can say to you. It's a real tragedy. We'll do our best to find the cause. I really don't know what's causing this," said MacTaggart. "I think he just fell. He fell and hit his head." That must be it, said Fiona. It's a sad case, but there's nothing we can do about it. We'll write it down as accidental death. A couple of weeks later, Williamson came through and said, I know we haven't had any more problems on the campuses. I've been speaking to my cousin on the northern and he says they've had another eight on the Cairngorms. Says the climbers are scared to go up there now and it's going to hit the ski trade. No doubt it'll hit the ski trade in the winter. It's just too many cases. And what do the northern put it down to? It's always the same. Someone appears to have died suddenly stuck on the hill, with a terrible bruise on their face, sometimes on their hands. There's something stalking them out there. People are saying there's a beast on the hills. There's rumours, rumours I tell you, that there's some kind of monster out there. People are, people are scared to go up beyond 500 feet, because 500 feet is the lowest that it's happened so far. Okay, okay. Uh, when was the last report we had of abominable snowmen on the on the Cairngorms? Oh well, we haven't had any abominable snowmen on the Cairngorms for the last three or four years. We think they've all been driven north to Norway, and across the ice packs. Ah. Uh, what come back? Maybe it's the abominable snowmen that have come back. No, no, I'm sure it's not that. The abominable snowmen yet usually eat their victims. These haven't been eaten. Hmm. It's very strange. But unless we get a call from the northern, we can't intervene, says McTaggart. So they've seen sense at last, said Fiona. Aye, they have, said Inspector McTaggart. The northern have phoned us up and said they need our help. Not for nothing is Glasgow the murder capital of Europe. If they need a murder case solved, it's a Strathclyde piece they call. Well, let's review the situation. There have been an unusual number 
of climbers found dead on the hills. How did you Four get times as many as a, as you'd normally get in a year. In just two months. And that's happened in the last two months. The tourist trade is suffering badly. No one dares go up the hills. Then there are rumours of monsters. There are rumours of all sorts of horrid things living on the hills. Well, there can only be one. Shh, Daniel. Daniel, keep quiet. There are rumours of all sorts of horrid things on the hills. Now we know that only one of the climbers had been killed by a wolf. And we also know that the ice bears don't go up the hills very much. And that leaves the yetis. I still think it could be the yetis. Let's go up and find someone who knows about it. So they went up to Glen Lyon and spoke to Farker, the head of the Glen Lyon Yeti Hound, a uh, Yeti Hunt. Aye, we do get a few yetis raiding this far south. The hunt can normally drive them north, and if we get all the hunts together, we can usually drive them off the hills and onto the pack ice before it thaws, and then we're free of them for the summer. Now, are you sure you were able to do that last spring? Oh, aye, we did that. I, I'm not convinced. I think we need to do a sweep. Sweep of the hilltops. So can you call the ha hounds and call the huntsmen together? And we'll do a sweep. Okay, said Farker, and went and got his horn. He blew his horn loud and clear. Toot, 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 toot. Half an hour later, Inspector McTaggart and Fiona were in the saddle and beside them were twelve huntsmen in their lovett jackets, the loaded capes and, and their deerstalker hats riding the finest group of Irish elk that you could see. These were well-trained hunting elk. They could mount the, the steepest slopes and gallop along the tops of the hills. And beside them, they had 24 Irish wolfhounds, all baying and snarling. OK, let's go, said Farker. Up into the hills we go. So off they went, galloping up into the hills. At one stage, the hounds seemed to have got a scent. They started dashing off ahead. Aha! They have found a yeti, said McTaggart. They raced off, but in the end, it was only a grizzly bear who snarled at the hounds they backed off. Oh, no, the bears are protected. We can't touch them. Come on, let's look. keep on looking for the yetis. Well, they rode across the hilltops for three days and never picked a trace of a yeti. So back they came. Well, thank you very much, Farker, for your help. But there don't seem to be any yetis in the neighbourhood. So that's ruled out. So they went back to their hotel and wondered what to do next. Just then the phone rang. Oh, it's terrible news, said Fiona. It's happened in the city. city. We've got to get back quick. They headed back and had to go to a building site on the south side. It was where the co-op were putting up their new 40-storey office block.
there was a crowd gathered round. The foot of the 40-storey block, five workmen had fallen off. And they'd obviously died on the way down or when they hit the ground. Now, where had these men been working? They'd been working on the top floor. Five of them died in one go. How did they all fall at the same time? This thing flies, I know it. Health and safety were called. There's going to be hell to pay for this, they said. These men had no safety harnesses on. They should have had safety harnesses and retaining wires. No wonder they fell. Ah, well, it's not, that's not a murder case. That's just a health and safety case, said Fiona. Let's go away. So off they went. A sad case, but none of our business. Next, there were a series of mysterious deaths of windmill repairmen <laughs> were found to be falling from the windmills as they repaired them. Do you see a connection here? Fiona said. Yes, I do. The height's coming down, isn't it? Yes, it is. The last of those windmills was only 300 feet. Aye, but it was on a 100-foot hill. So, okay. 400 feet or so. Wow. I think we ought to give a warning that Tom and Tool ought to be evacuated. Okay. And Lead Hills as well. All villages higher up the hills than the safety line have got to be evacuated. But what's doing it? What's doing it? has to be something that's flying. I told you that it was that. It can't, it can't be the Yetis. It's years since they last had an Air Force. <laughs> what can it be? Let's go to the Met Office and see if they've any news of anything unusual detected by the weather radar. So they went to the Met Office in air and said, has your weather radar picked up anything unusual? Oh yes, we had a very interesting snowstorm yesterday. It was over to the west side and then there were a couple of tornadoes. Ah, but this, that, that's not so unusual. What, I want anything really unusual. We had a few of those ghosts and a couple of UFOs. Ah. Ah, okay, okay. So it's UFOs we're after. Oh, ghosts. It might be ghosts. Let's go to the airport and see if we can spot any. Don't think it's that. Along they went to Presswick Airport to see if they could hire a plane. Uh, it's not that easy at the moment. The, the the flights are very busy. But there's a Birmingham butterfly over there that's free. We could hire it to the police if you want. Do you have a pilot available? No, we don't have a pilot. Okay, the airport will supply a pilot. And the whole thing will only cost you £3,000. £3,000? That's ridiculous. We don't have any pounds anymore. We'll have to pay in kroner. Okay, we'll do it for 200 kroner. Fair enough. So, they got on to the, the Birmingham Butterfly. Fiona said, I feel much safer in these five engine planes. Do you know they can still fly with two of the engines switched off? Yes, that, that's very reassuring, said uh, Taggart. And off they, they took. He said, I want you to circle round Goat Fell on Aaron and see if you see anything unusual there. Mm, they flew over. Just the usual pile of dead climbers. Not much else. What are those red things over there? Said Fiona. And they saw some red dots coming out of the clouds. We'll fly over and check them, said the pilot. And what did they see? They saw a bunch of red balloons. There was in fact a stream of these red balloons. 
They were very, very pale red, and difficult to see. Almost as if they were just slightly pink. From a distance, the sun would glint off them. And if you could see them against the clouds, you could see them. <coughs> then when you got close, it was difficult to keep your eyes on them. But of course, the plane was going fast. Okay, okay, I think this is suspicious, said McTaggart. Fly me quickly to Aberdeen. So, half an hour later, they were in Aberdeen. And he said, I'm just going to make a call. And he called to the United Society of Trollermen of Aberdeen and said, could you get us a lightweight net? A really lightweight net. Well, they brought him a net. And they fixed it to the back of the Birmingham butterfly. They had two experienced trollermen to handle the net and took off again. Let's head down towards the southwest. That's where we saw them before. When they saw the red dots, they put the net out, swept it through the air, and soon had collected several of them and brought them back and landed and went carefully towards it. And they were the most horrible things you could imagine. Great big red balloons with the crest along the top and tentacles hanging down. I've never seen those before, said McTaggart. Oh, I've seen them before, said the trollerman. You usually see them floating on the sea. They don't usually get up to that altitude. Now, those are Peruvian men of war. The most deadly jellyfish known to man. When it gets really hot off Peru, the sea warms. And the hydrogen in the jellyfish expands and they take off into the air. Then they get blown by the trade winds. It's just the freak weather conditions we've been having this last summer. They've been blowing them in from Peru. They wouldn't normally come this way. What can we do about it, said McTaggart. Oh, I don't know. I'm just a trollerman. We'll have to see what we can do about it, said <coughs> McTaggart. So, said McTaggart, it seems like we've got a problem with these Peruvian men of war jellyfish. I think we best check it out. We'll go along to the Loch Arbor Institute of Marine Biology and find out what they think of it. And let's put one of these in a plastic bag. We'll make sure that we wear, wear a rubber suit and rubber gloves as we handle it so we don't get stung. So he went and got a, a rubber suit and rubber gloves from a chemical factory and loaded the, the jellyfish into a plastic bag and sealed it. And they drove off to the Loch Harbour Institute of Marine Biology. At the institute, they asked if they could see the institute's expert on jellyfish, who was very pleased to see the specimen. He said, oh, we haven't had a specimen of those for years, and that's a very big and fine one. Big and fine one it may be, but they're a hazard. Do you know how many hikers they've killed this year? No, I don't. Well, we reckon it's at least 18 now. And that's not counting the building workers. Oh, they must be coming down low. You ought to watch out, actually. I've heard from the weather forecasters that there's a depression on the way. And when there's a depression, oh the low pressure brings them down lower. They may even get down to the level of cities. Oh my goodness, thought my target. If that happens, they could wipe out air. They could, yes. We'll have to do something about it. What can we do about it? Well, you could wait till the wind shifts. Normally what happens is that the, the wind never brings them this far. They, they normally fall back down to sea somewhere in the mid-Atlantic. The, the wind must be exceptionally strong at the moment. But 
if this strong wind continues, and then there's a depression, we'll get them dumped on our heads, wherever we are. Ah, I some might get blown to Russia, but that's no co consolation to us. Ah, what can we do? Well, we don't normally have problems with this. We're only concerned with marine biology. I suggest you go and visit the, the Institute of Pest Control in Berwick. Okay, we'll go off to Berwick and see the Institute of Pest Control. They drove along to Berwick and arrived at a large building which had a huge statue of a mosquito and a huge and equally ugly statue of a bed bug on either side of the door. Oh, those are horrid, said Fiona. I agree they're horrid. God knows what they've got in here. They went through a hall lined with enlarged models of all sorts of horrid insects, including some particularly nasty looking wasps, and explained their problem to one of the chief pest control officers. Mm, jellyfish are. Well, we normally concentrate on insects. But these are flying jellyfish, so they'd probably be our department. Otherwise, they'd be the Ministry of Fishery Control. Have you spoken to the Ministry of Fishery Control? Fiona said, I phoned them up, but they said jellyfish aren't fish, so that's not their responsibility. They're medusoids. Okay, okay, well, we'll take over. I think it, we'll use our standard techniques. Um, you say you've got a plane available. Yes, we've hired a plane from Presswick Airport. We've hired it for a couple of months, so it, it should be available. Okay, okay. Um, I'll just whistle up some help from my, my staff here. He picked up a whistle and blew hard. A moment later, a man rushed in, carrying a box. Will this do? He opened the box and said, Yep, get me... Um, 54 million of them, please. Okay, we'll bring you 54 million, he said. 54 million watts, said Fiona. Well, there's only 1 billion in that box, but we'll get another 54 boxes and you have 54 million. But 54 million what? 54 million parasitic wasps, of course. You can let them off from your plane across the path of the medusoids and they'll soon deal with them. So we, we won't be able to give you all 54 million a, in one day. You'll get, get a million a day and that should keep you going. So McTaggart said, can you deliver them to Prestwick Airport? Oh, no bother. We can deliver parasitic wasps anywhere in the country. So they went off to Prestwick Airport the next day and spoke to the pilot. I know you had an unusual job to do yesterday. You had to pull a trawler deck through the sky. Well, today it's a lot easier. We've just got to take this large box of wasps. I'm not having wasps in my plane. It's a hazard. How would you like to fly a plane with wasps in it? Or it's okay, these are very tiny wasps and they don't sting people. Well, okay, okay. So long as they're not let into the cockpit, you can have them in the passenger compartment and I'll lock the door. Fair enough, you lock the door and it's not going to be me that does it anyway. Fiona will have to throw them out the window. I didn't know that. I thought you were going to do it, Inspector. Oh, inspectors don't do that. that. That's a job for constables. Well, they were strapped in Fiona was strapped in Aww. and this, with long straps Aww. that were fixed to the side opposite the door Aww. and they took Aww. off, flew out to sea till they saw the first of a cloud of the medusoids coming towards them. Then the door was opened and with the strap stopping her falling out, Fiona leaned out 
and picked out one packet of wasps after another and tore off the lid and shook them out. And of course, the air was rushing past, so they didn't have a chance to sting her. Packet after packet of wasps was released into the air. Then they flew back. That day, no medusoids arrived over the country. They did that every day for 54 days. 55. 55 days. And at the end, no medusoids had arrived. And the winds had anyway shifted. So none seemed to be coming anyway. There were none to be seen. So what had happened? Well, the parasitic wasps had homed in on them and laid their eggs in them. And of course, to lay their eggs, they have to sting them first. And as soon as they stung them, the hydrogen leaked out of the, their, their balloons and they fell to the sea. And then the wasp larvae multiplied in the floating piles of jelly that were floating on the sea. Two or three days later, millions and millions of more wasps took off. So soon there was an impenetrable cloud of wasps floating over the eastern Atlantic. And they now dangerous to people? And stopping the medusoids coming. Luckily, the wasps were only about two millimeters across and not interested in people.